Welcome to World Med School. My name is Helen McShane. I'm Professor of Vaccinology at the University of Oxford. And in this lecture today, I'm going to tell you where we are with TB vaccine development. TB remains a very significant cause of mortality and morbidity throughout the world. The emergence of multi-extensively and now totally drug-resistant strains of Mycobacterium tuberculosis have further confounded the problem and meant our ability to treat this disease is worse than ever. The geographical overlap with the HIV epidemic has had a devastating impact, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and it is estimated that a third of the world's population are latently infected with TB. There are three arms to TB control, and all of them are necessary. Firstly, the active treatment of cases of TB disease, and there is a very urgent need for new drugs to improve our ability to treat, particularly the drug-resistant strains. We need better ways of making rapid and accurate diagnosis and better diagnostic tests in order to more quickly diagnose people with TB to reduce the burden of transmission. But ultimately, to prevent TB is the long-term goal, and for that, we need a more effective vaccine than BCG. BCG is the only vaccine licensed for TB. It's Bacille Calmet de Guerin, and it is a live attenuated strain of Mycobacterium bovis. BCG has been around for almost 100 years, and it was first used in 1921, where it was given orally. There have been many studies looking at the efficacy of BCG, i.e. how good it is at stopping people getting TB. And what those studies have shown is that BCG is good at protecting against severe disseminated TB, particularly TB that is spread outside of the lungs. It also protects against leprosy. What BCG is less good at doing is protecting against lung disease, particularly in adolescents and adults. And boosting with BCG, i.e. giving it more than once, doesn't seem to make it any better. This slide has a cartoon where it shows the protective efficacy of BCG in various observational and controlled clinical trials. If you focus on the top box, the controlled trials, which are the methodologically more rigorous trials, you can see that there are some trials, such as the British School Children British MRC study, where there was 80% efficacy. And there are some studies, such as the South India Chinkleput study, where there is zero efficacy. If you do a meta-analysis on this, the average reduction in incidence is about 50%. However, with that range of 0 to 80%, really that meta-analysis doesn't mean very much. We know that latitude has a major effect on efficacy, and the closer you live to the equator, the less likely BCG is to work. Understanding why BCG doesn't work is really important if we are to make a better vaccine that overcomes those limitations. We know that the different strains of BCG in use throughout the world are genetically different, but whether or not those genetic sequence differences mean anything in terms of protective efficacy is much less clear. We know that nutrition is important, but many of the areas where TB is most endemic are not necessarily the most malnourished, so that may not be the only explanation. And we know that exposure to environmental mycobacteria, these are pathogens that live in the soil that come from the same family as TB, but don't cause disease unless you're profoundly immunocompromised, may be important in covering up the immunogenicity and efficacy of BCG or by blocking it, i.e. stopping its replication. The other thing we need to understand if we're to make a better vaccine against TB is what kind of immune response we're trying to induce. If we look at the 2 billion people who are latently infected, we can consider those as potentially being a state of protection. And if we could understand what immune response they have prevents that reactivation, perhaps that's what we wish to mimic with a new vaccine. So what we do know about protective immunity is that class 2 restricted CD4 T cells are essential for protective immunity. We see this in animal models, but we see this most clearly in HIV infected adults who are more susceptible to TB. We know that class 1 cytokines such as interferon gamma and TNF are essential for protection. And we also think that other aspects of cellular immunity, CD8 positive T cells, gamma delta T cells, IL-17, IL-2 and CD1 restricted T cells are probably important as well. And there's less evidence for a strong role for B cells and antibodies in protection against TB. 
we then need to consider the potential vaccine types that we can make to try and develop a new TB vaccine. And broadly speaking, we can either take a whole organism approach and either improve BCG in some way, which is whole organism live attenuated mycobacterium bovis, or we can rationally attenuate mycobacterium tuberculosis. And there are groups doing both those things. Or we can make a subunit vaccine and pick one or a few immunodominant antigens and pick a powerful or potent antigen delivery system that we can combine in a subunit vaccine. So putting all that together, we need to include BCG in some shape or form in a new regimen because of that protection BCG confers against disseminated disease. And we want to induce a potent cell-mediated immune response. And there are three possible ways to do this. Either you leave BCG as it is and develop a subunit vaccine to be given at a later point in time, or you replace BCG with a, an improved genetically engineered BCG or attenuated strain of TB, or you put the two together and enhance an improved BCG. This slide, slide 11, shows the global TB vaccine pipeline, really just to illustrate that there are a number of candidates in clinical trials. The details are not important as the details will change year by year, but 12 years ago, if I'd put this slide up, there would have been no new TB vaccines. The slide would have been blank. And I think the progress we've made in the last 12 years in moving vaccines through to clinical testing and proof of concept efficacy trials is enormous. One of the most clinically advanced new candidates is MVA85A. This is a vaccine we developed in my group in Oxford, and it's designed to boost BCG. This is a recombinant viral vector, a recombinant MVA, which is an attenuated strain of vaccinia, which expresses antigen 85A, which is a very immunodominant antigen from TB. Slide 13 shows the clinical trials that we've conducted with this vaccine since 2002. First in the UK, then in the Gambia, and then since 2002. 2005, a large program of research in South Africa, and most recently in Senegal. All of these studies have looked at safety and immunogenicity, and the efficacy trials at the bottom of this Gantt chart have looked for the first time at efficacy. Does this vaccine work to stop people getting TB? In 2013, we published the results of our efficacy trial, which was the first efficacy trial of a subunit TB vaccine ever conducted. It was in 2,797 BCG vaccinated babies. This figure taken from the paper shows the flow of subjects through this trial, shows that we consented 4,754 infants or the mothers of those infants to randomise 2,797 infants. And I will just draw your attention to the excluded infants. 281 infants were quantiferon positive. This means they were latently infected with TB at 12 weeks of age. This represents about 6% of our screening population. And I think really illustrates the burden of disease in this area. We saw an excellent safety profile with this vaccine in this trial but we did not see any enhancement in efficacy. So when you look at endpoint one, which is our most stringent endpoint, we had 39 cases in the placebo arm and 32 cases in the MVA85A arm. This gives a non-significant vaccine efficacy of 17.3%. In summary, there has been enormous progress made in this field in the last decade. We now have over a dozen vaccines being tested in clinical trials, but the challenges for the next decade are very clear. With the results of our efficacy trial, it's become clear that we need better models to predict which vaccines should progress to efficacy, both in terms of the immunology and the preclinical animal models. We need to use every opportunity to identify correlates, and we need to use the human efficacy data to iteratively improve these models. We clearly need to design some more potent vaccines, and at the moment there is no substitute ultimately for human efficacy testing. Thank you, and thank you for studying with World Med School.